Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is the superposition theorem as applied to AC circuit analysis. Our objective is to learn to employ the superposition theorem in an effort to solve for desired electrical quantities for AC circuits with more than one source. Bottom line up front, effects add up. The superposition theorem is the simplest and most reliable of circuit analysis techniques because it makes so much intuitive sense. When tasked with carrying a heavy couch upstairs with a group of your ratty friends, it helps when they're all pushing in the same direction. If one of your stupider friends is under the assumption you're moving out rather than moving in, their opposition reduces the resultant effects. If you are the stupid friend opposing everyone else's combined efforts, your contribution will be overwhelmed. Long story short, don't have stupid friends help you move a heavy couch upstairs. Ask me how I know. As applied to electrical circuits, the superposition theorem is simply series parallel circuit analysis of the same circuit with multiple sources from the perspective of each individual source, and then the individual results are summated accounted for magnitude, polarity, and direction. This lecture therefore operates under the presumption the viewer is marginally skilled in series parallel circuit analysis of AC circuits. In addition to reliable series parallel circuit analysis skills, one must also have a modicum of organizational ability to properly apply the superposition theorem. For AC circuits with a single source, polarity isn't too much of a concern since it cyclically oscillates anyways. However, polarity becomes an important consideration when more than one source interacts with the same circuit. The polarity markers for a sinusoidal AC voltage source and the arrows for sinusoidal AC current sources simply imply that the source initiates the analysis in the indicated direction. These indicators need to be respected since they dictate how the sources route current through the circuit as a function of time. If your results indicate source A pushes 1 amp at an angle of 20 degrees through a 20 ohm impedance at an angle of 25 degrees left to right, then source B pushes 1.5 amps at an angle of 15 degrees through the same impedance right to left, and source C pushes 750 milliampers at an angle of 10 degrees through the same impedance left to right, the summation of these three currents accounting for phase shift and direction is 244.3 milliampers at an angle of 20.1 degrees going left to right and any other answer is wrong. You'll note currents A and C are aiding each other and that they are traveling in the same direction. Current B in contrast is opposing both A and C because it is traveling in the opposite direction. When summating these individual contributions, assuming A and C are positive and B is negative, allows us to account for direction. This housekeeping trick also works for voltage polarity. Given the assumed current directions, source A would induce a voltage differential of 20 volts at an angle of 45 degrees across the impedance, positive to negative, left to right. Similarly, source B would induce a voltage differential of 30 volts at an angle of 40 degrees across the impedance, positive to negative, right to left. And finally, source C would induce a voltage differential of 15 volts at an angle of 35 degrees across the impedance, positive to negative, left to right. Accounting for magnitude, phase shift, and polarity, the summation of these individual voltage drops would mean this impedance would experience a differential of 4.9 volts at an angle of 45.1 degrees, positive to negative, left to right. Again, you'll note voltage A and C are aiding each other and that their polarity is the same. Voltage B, in contrast, is opposing both A and C because its polarity is opposite. When summating these individual contributions, assuming A and C are positive and B is negative, allows us to account for polarity. Note that the final summated differential of 4.9 volts at an angle of 45.1 degrees would indeed induce 244.3 milliampers of current at an angle of 20.1 degrees through an impedance of 20 ohms at an angle of 25 degrees. This is to suggest that your final results should be supportive of one another and there exist ample opportunities to check your work via Ohm's Law, Kirchhoff's Current Law, and Kirchhoff's Voltage Law. It should be noted that these calculations initially assumed left to right is the positive direction. If, however, we operated under the assumption where right to left is positive, we'd obtain a current of 244.3 milliampers at an angle of negative 159.9 degrees going from right to left. Similarly, our total voltage drop would be 4.9 volts at an angle of negative 134.9 degrees, positive to negative, right to left. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this assumption. All you have to realize is that source A and C are aiding each other, whereas source B is opposing A and C. 
just pick a direction and stay consistent. While a reliable technique, the superposition theorem has its disadvantages, tricky spots, and limitations. The principal disadvantage of the superposition theorem is that it requires independent analysis of the same circuit from the perspective of each source. If your circuit has two sources, this means two independent analyses and a final summation. If your circuit has three sources, this means three independent analyses and a final summation. If your circuit has 100 sources, you may wish to investigate the use of a computer to solve for the desired electrical properties. You get my point. Other circuit analysis techniques like mash and nodal analysis can yield the same result in a single, admittedly convoluted step. However, they necessitate special math skills with little carryover value outside these limited circumstances. This being said, the reason I'm such a big fan of superposition is that it yields reliable results using skills you should already feel comfortable with applying, notably traditional AC series parallel circuit analysis. Why learn special skills when the skills you already have yield the same results? Additionally, the superposition theorem does come with some associated trickery. As we'll soon demonstrate, the superposition theorem necessitates the removal of sources not currently under consideration with the incorporation of shorts and opens. The addition of shorts or opens may fundamentally change the nature of the as-analyzed circuit. Recall that an open presents an infinite impedance through which no current will flow. Shorts, in contrast, present no impedance through which all current will flow in preference to all other paths. We'll discuss these modifications in greater detail when we apply the superposition theorem to some illustrated example problems. Finally, the superposition theorem is limited to the summation of linear properties only. This is to suggest that properties like voltage and current are cool, since Ohm's law is linear, whereas power is not cool. Power, being the product of voltage and current, is not a linear property, but rather geometric in nature. The power dissipated by a component from the perspective of individual sources is essentially nonsense, and power effects are not additive. This being said, if you use the final summated voltage and final summated current when polarity, direction, and phase shift have been properly accounted for, these can be used to solve for final power. Again, considering our earlier example impedance of 20 ohms at an angle of 25 degrees being acted upon by three sources where the final summation of voltage differentials accounting for polarity and phase shift is 4.9 volts at an angle of 45.1 degrees, and the final summation of currents accounting for magnitude, phase shift, and direction is 244.3 milliampers at an angle of 21.1 degrees. An application of the AC power equations demonstrate that the impedance is experiencing 1.2 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 1.1 watts is directed towards real power and 504.5 millivars is directed towards a reactive interchange. These power figures using the final summated voltage and final summated current figures are correct whereas the summation of individual power figures for individual source contributions would not be correct because power is a nonlinear property and the superposition theorem only applies to linear sources and linear properties like Ohm's law. The procedure to employ the superposition theorem is relatively straightforward. The general steps are as follows. Identify a single source of interest. Remove all other sources from consideration. Voltage sources are removed by substituting with a short circuit or a low impedance path. Current sources are removed by substituting an open circuit or an infinite impedance path. Be warned that the addition of opens and shorts in the original circuit may fundamentally change the nature of the as-analyzed circuit and may help to redraw the circuit. Then one needs to perform series parallel circuit analysis of the as-analyzed circuit for the desired electrical properties. Take note of not only the magnitude and phase shift, but also the polarity and the assumed direction of desired electrical properties. Then one needs to repeat these first steps for all other sources. Once you've performed these steps for all sources, one needs to summate all linear properties taking into account magnitude, phase shift, polarity, and direction. Nonlinear properties like power can be solved for at this time using final summated voltage and final summated current figures. Let's try an illustrated example of superposition theorem applied to this series parallel circuit with two sources. Sinusoidal AC current source IA is 25 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees and pointing in the upwards direction. 
Sinusoidal AC voltage source EB is 18 volts at an angle of 0 degrees and oriented positive to negative, top to bottom. Impedance element Z1 is 240 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. Impedance element Z2 is 400 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Impedance element Z3 is 300 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. And finally, impedance element Z4 is 600 ohms at an angle of 85 degrees. Let's apply the superposition theorem to solve for the voltage drop across and the current through each impedance element. This is one of my favorite types of circuits to begin discussion of superposition theorem since it dramatically illustrates the effects of opens and shorts in the as analyzed circuit. By the way, for those of you skilled in DC circuit analysis, you'll note AC superposition theorem is essentially identical to the superposition theorem as applied to DC circuits, only we're adding phasers. If you feel so qualified, by all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If not, feel free to follow along for this first example problem. Let's start this analysis from the perspective of a sinusoidal current source IA. This means we need to remove the voltage source EB by replacing with a short or a low impedance path. Note when we redraw the as-analyzed circuit, including the short, the nature of this circuit has fundamentally changed. Note that any current traveling out of an impedance element Z3 will travel through the zero impedance short rather than the path afforded by impedance element Z4. The inclusion of the short has effectively removed impedance element Z4 from consideration. No current will travel through impedance element Z4 and there will be no voltage drop across it. I4 equals zero and V4 equals zero. With impedance element Z4 removed from consideration, current will flow through the circuit as indicated. Sinusoidal AC current source IA will force 25 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees through impedance element Z1. I1 equals 25 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees traveling left to right. Current will split into two paths, one through impedance element Z2 and the other through impedance element Z3. An application of the current divider rule demonstrates I2 will be 15 milliampers at an angle of 53.1 degrees traveling top to bottom. A subsequent application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates I3 will be the remaining 20 milliampers at an angle of 36.9 degrees traveling top to bottom. Let's now consider voltage. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates V1 will be 6 volts at an angle of 0 degrees oriented positive to negative left to right. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates V2 will be 6 volts at an angle of negative 36.9 degrees oriented positive to negative top to bottom. Given impedance element Z2 and Z3 are in parallel with one another, V3 will also be 6 volts at an angle of negative 36.9 degrees oriented positive to negative top to bottom. The series parallel analysis from the perspective of current source IA is now complete. Let's put these values to the side and now do the same thing for voltage source EB. When sinusoidal AC voltage source EB is our source of interest, we need to remove sinusoidal AC current source IA by replacing it with open. Note when the circuit is redrawn, the as analyzed circuit, including the open, the nature of this circuit is fundamentally changed in that no current will travel through impedance element Z1. The inclusion of this open has effectively removed impedance element Z1 from consideration. With no current traveling through it, there will be no voltage drop across it. V1 equals zero and I1 equals zero. It may help to again redraw this circuit when impedance element Z1 has been removed from consideration. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this modified circuit indicates two current paths one through the series combination of impedance element Z2 and Z3, and another through impedance element Z4. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates V3 will be 10.8 volts at an angle of 53.1 degrees, pointed positive to negative, bottom to top. A subsequent application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates V2 will be the remaining 14.4 volts at an angle of negative 36.9 degrees, positive to negative, top to bottom. For our as-drawn circuit, voltage across impedance element Z4 will be equal to EB. V4 therefore equals 18 volts at an angle of 0 degrees oriented positive to negative top to bottom. Let's now consider current. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates I2 will be 36 milliampers at an angle of 53.1 degrees traveling bottom to top. Given impedance element Z2 and Z3 are in series with one another, 
I-3 will also be 36 milliamp years at an angle of 53.1 degrees, only this time the assumed direction of travel is top to bottom. Finally, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates I-4 will be 30 milliamp years at an angle of negative 85 degrees, traveling top to bottom. The series parallel circuit analysis from the perspective of only voltage source EB is now complete. Now that we've completed independent analysis of this circuit from the perspective of all sources, the only task remaining us is to summate these effects accounted for magnitude, phase shift, polarity, and direction. Again, before doing so, note how the inclusion of shorts and opens have fundamentally changed the nature of this circuit. Shorting out EB effectively removes impedance element Z4 from consideration. In contrast, the inclusion of the open effectively removes impedance element Z1 from consideration. From the perspective of one source or another, this same circuit exhibits fundamentally different properties. Let's summate individual properties. Given current source IA induces 25 milliamp years at an angle of zero degrees through impedance element Z1 left to right, and voltage source EB induces no current through impedance element Z1, it can be said when these effects are superimposed upon one another, impedance element Z1 ultimately experience 25 milliamp years of current at an angle of zero degrees traveling left to right. Following similar methodology, the voltage drop across impedance element Z1 is 6 volts at an angle of zero degrees. With respect to impedance element Z2, it appears current source IA and voltage source EB are aiding one another and that current direction and polarity are the same. In this scenario, we'll assume top to bottom is positive and simply add the effects. Impedance element Z2 ultimately experiences 51 milliamp years of current at an angle of 53.1 degrees traveling top to bottom. Following similar methodology, the voltage drop across impedance element Z2 is 20.4 volts at an angle of negative 36.9 degrees, positive to negative, top to bottom. With respect to impedance element Z3, it appears current source IA and voltage source EB are opposing one another and that current direction and polarity are opposite. It appears voltage source EB's magnitude contribution is larger, so we'll just assume the bottom is positive and the top is negative and simply subtract current source IA's contribution. It can be said that when these effects are superimposed upon one another, impedance element Z3 ultimately experiences 41.2 milliamp years at an angle of 82.2 degrees, traveling bottom to top. Finally, given current source IA induces no current through impedance element Z4, and voltage source EB induces 30 milliamp years at an angle of negative 85 degrees through impedance element Z4 top to bottom, it can be said when these effects are superimposed upon one another, impedance element Z4 ultimately experiences 30 milliamp years of current at an angle of negative 85 degrees traveling top to bottom. Following similar methodology, the voltage drop across impedance element Z4 is 18 volts at an angle of zero degrees oriented positive to negative top to bottom. Now that the final summated voltage and current figures have been calculated using the superposition theorem, one is free to perform analysis of other nonlinear properties like power using these final figures. All right, let's bring this introductory lecture to a close. For those seeking additional guidance on this topic, rest easy. I'll soon publish another lecture featuring solely illustrated examples of superposition theorems applied to AC circuits. Until then, let me remind you the superposition theorem isn't necessarily a new technique but rather repetitive series parallel circuit analysis, a technique you've got ample experience with by now. Very often, it isn't necessarily the electrical concepts, but rather organizing the results of the independent analyses and accounting for magnitude, phase shift, polarity, and direction that trips students up when employing superposition theorem for the first time. Current with a wrong direction or voltage with a wrong polarity or failing to take into account phase shift can have disastrous consequences. Take your time and stay organized when summating results. Pick a direction and just stick with it. In conclusion, we learned to employ the superposition theorem in an effort to solve for desired electrical quantities for AC circuits with more than one source. We learned that linear properties like voltage and current can be summated, accounting for magnitude, phase shift, polarity, and direction. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.